All right, guys, we're far along. It's article number five. So we're at primary suspended instruments. So we're going to be talking today about hi-hat cymbals, ride cymbals, and rack toms, which I have not put up here yet. Before we continue, I can't urge you enough to go back to the previous series. Each piece of this ergonomic series is slowly building up the drum set. It is taking us six months to get here, but ultimately what I want you to realize is that all of these pieces are supposed to be quick assessments that you could do as you're setting up a, your drum set to check your range of motion, check your range of motion, to make sure your throne height's good, the snare drum's good, and if you're a gigging drummer and you learn these processes quick, it's so fast to make sure the drum set is set up just for you. So let's, let's dive into these primary suspended instruments. Now as always, I like to remove the dogma. But instead of dogma, I should change it this time and call it visual bias. I mean, when I was growing up, much like you other millennials, I'm sure you're influenced by Travis Barker if you're a rock kid, who had these flat cymbals that were everywhere and were up really, really high. Nowadays, we have Benny Grebs and Mark Giuliano that have very specific ride placements and very unique uh, ways of where they put the hi-hat and other auxiliary cymbals. Visually, we'll look at our favorite drummers and we'll see where they put their instruments and we will put our instruments in a similar position because we want to achieve a similar sound or a similar look to look just like them. I won't lie, I'm influenced by Mark Giuliana and J.P. Bouvet and several others and those characteristics come out in my drum set, but I will say that I customize the drum set based off of my body and the way I like to play with some of the idiosyncrasies that they put in. So firstly, be aware of your biases and the people that inspire you, but make sure you're not setting rules based off of how they set it up and making sure that you set it up just like them. Journal devices we're going to be talking about today will be the hi-hat cymbals, the ride cymbal, and the rack toms, which I'll put up as we get the process going. Now, why I want to just take a quick second to talk about each one, we won't spend a lot of time, but it's important for us to understand that hi-hat cymbals, rides, and tom-toms, generally speaking, have different responses when we hit them. Which means when we get to the internal components, and we think about the shoulder complex and the wrist, we have a hi-hat cymbal, at least the riding surface for this conversation, and when we have the hi-hat cymbal, when I play it, the hi-hat will bounce back with an amount that will be different than the ride cymbal. The ride cymbal may absorb more because it has way more flex, way more give, and it can absorb more of the forces of the drumstick. And tom-toms, depending on how you've tuned them, can either be really, really high and bouncy, similar to a snare but not quite, or you could have a big thuddy tom where your stick gets stuck. Why is that significant? Well, if you like instruments that absorb your drumstick forces, like big swooshy rides and toms that absorb the force more, that's all good, but we need to make sure that the angle of your tom and the active range of motion you have of your drumstick with your wrist and your shoulder allow for some absorption. Because if you have a drum that is absorbing force and you hit it, and your stick actually gets kind of stuck and you almost got to pull it out to make sure that uh, you can get it back to hit the next stroke, you need to make sure you have that range of motion so you're not going to get tendinitis or carpal tunnel syndrome from that or from that. It's not a big issue, but we need to realize that we're each different and how we like to play will mean that we have different responsibilities at each joint. Okay guys, so quickly, the internal components that we're going to talk about today, we should be considering the wrist and hand, but we did talk about that last week and how if you have a pronated position, palms down playing style, or a thumbs up French grip style, that your range of motion may be different. So just please review last week's article. What we are going to briefly talk about visually is the shoulder joint something called scapulohumeral rhythm, and we're going to introduce some of the muscles. Now, scapulohumeral rhythm is something that's important for us to be aware of because as we start getting to higher instruments, posture becomes an important question. And we're going to talk a little bit more about posture in the last video series once everything's set up. But scapulohumeral rhythm is the rhythm between your humerus, this arm bone, or the bone that's up here, and your scapula, which is your shoulder blade. Now, as in the article, I describe four joints. We have a sternoclavicular joint, an acromioclavicular joint, a glenohumeral joint, and a scapular thoracic joint. Not really important, but it's important to recognize that this shoulder complex has four individual joints. And each of these joints have responsibility to move and reduce the stress on this system so that way you can actually get your arm from a side position and all the way up nice and easily. Frankly, if you want to feel what it feels like to not have access to this, 
Squeeze your shoulder blade back and down as hard as you can and try to lift your arm up without letting your shoulder blade move. Really focus on that shoulder blade not moving because you might let it move and you'll find that you can only get your arm to here before you get pinching. Scapular femoral rhythm is important and we're going to talk about how to check that with each instrument here today and more so for the final series. Now, the reason why it's important is because one of the common shoulder and neck injuries that we see as drummers is either a rotator cuff injury or a trap strain or some sort of neck strain. So we're going to talk really quickly about muscles and I'm going to use this yellow belt and then we'll talk about something called a moment arm that will be important for all these pieces. Muscle wise, we have two muscles that I'm going to talk about for the video series. We have your traps and your rotator cuff muscles and I'm going to specifically talk about your supraspinitis. Quickly, you have a trap that goes from the back of your head to the top of your shoulder blade and for very muscular wrestlers, you guys can see they've got this huge muscle here and one of its responsibilities is to shrug you up and help with cervical rotation and motion of your head and stability of your neck. The second is the supraspinitis muscle, which if any of you have a rotator cuff muscle tear, 90% of the time it's this muscle. The rotator cuff muscle is a very small muscle that goes from this little gap in the shoulder blade, it swoops into the gap, it goes underneath this bone called your necromion here, and if my fist was the top of the humerus, it goes right into the top of it into something called the lesser tubercle on the outside of it. Why this thing always gets pinched is if I have this bone and it pushes, like say I'm holding my arm out for a long time or I'm internally rotated doing something with some high amount of force, it will take the arm bone, the humerus, and it will squish it up into the bottom of the acromion and can pinch the supraspinitis easily or the subacromial bursa or other tissues in there. Why is all that gobbledygook important? It's important for you guys to make sure that you're in a relaxed, comfortable position as you get to these suspended instruments. Because it's really easy to get a neck strain and if anyone's played a gig with a ride up really high for three hours, you'll know exactly what I mean. And it's really easy if you're playing aggressively with instruments really high that you can get forces up into the shoulder and get that pinching sensation here and here. And there are so many other injuries that happen but these are just two of the most common ones. So let's be aware of those. We're going to talk about something quickly called a moment arm and you could think of a moment arm as the distance between a force or a thing and the joint axis and that's a very butchered explanation. It's a perpendicular relationship between the line of force and the joint axis. So how do you feel that? Well if I take my arm and I have my arm hanging at my side, you guys will see that if I have this yellow rope and I put it at my side, you guys can't even see it. But if you could, it would go right through my shoulder and down to my hand. And how long could I have my arm hanging at my side for? For hours. Not really a problem. Now if I put my arm out to here and I hold it way out to the side as far as I can, that yellow rope ends up being about three feet away from me. I'm exaggerating a bit. But it's far away from my shoulder and this distance from my hand to my shoulder suddenly makes my arm weigh a heck of a lot more. What does that mean? Well, it means that if my instruments are too far away and I'm playing a ride cymbal way out here with my arm extended for a long period of time, no matter how good I am at playing the drums and how strong I am, my muscles are going to have to work hard to hold my arm up for a long period of time. Same with a hi-hat that's too high. So we want to try to have our arms as close to our body as we can when we're playing without being robotic. It's very easy when I talk about this stuff to think that I'm telling you to be stiff and close to your body. And I'm telling you to do that a little bit, but have the freedom to move so we reduce the strain or the likelihood of strain in these pieces. So the goal for today's assessment is to make the playing of the hi-hat, the ride cymbal, and the other primary suspended instruments as effortless as possible. Now keep in mind, I'm talking about these because these are the most mainstream instruments. Everyone has one or two rack toms or ride cymbal in the hat, generally speaking. If you have another cymbal that you play 80% or more of the time, that is not what I'm talking about. These same rules still apply. Just be aware of the characteristics of that drum and how much force it absorbs and your active range of motion. The first instrument that we're going to talk about assessing is the hi-hat cymbal. Now, the great thing about the hi-hats is we already know how far away they should be, right? Because we did it in the pedal series. We figured out based off of our hip ergonomics and our drum throne height how far away the foot pedal should be. Now, if you have extra range of motion from that and you can move your leg in further or move it away a little bit more, you very easily could adjust that based off of the size of the hi-hat symbols that you're using. Now, this assessment's pretty easy and this is kind of like the gigging man's assessment. 
We're going to do one. We're going to try to keep our arms closer to our body in a relaxed position. So I don't want your arms out like this because when we're out here, we have a bigger moment arm and there's more force that's trying to bring our arms down to the side. So there's more work. We're going to take our hands from that two inch position that we had in the snare drum series and we're going to move, try to from just our shoulder at this point, not our trunk, move my hand so the stick is two inches above the hi-hat and see if I can do the same with this one which I can do pretty easily without any spinal rotation. Now, the angle I have my hi-hats at right now and the position seems like it's pretty okay for me. And how I know that is if I'm here, you guys can see that the wrist, my forearm and wrist are in a relatively neutral position. So what it means is if I hit the hi-hat, I actually have enough range of motion in deflection and to do extension. So if I'm actually hitting it up here, which I wouldn't be, but if I was, I have that motion and I have the extension back. So if I hit the symbol and the symbol for whatever reason gives me bounce back and the stick gets thrown back all the way, I have this 90 degree excursion to actually slow down the range of motion so my wrist doesn't get hurt. Very simple, but if I have the hi-hat symbol too high or too low, we run the risk into, if I'm in the Travis Barker situation and I'm a smaller person with these high symbols and I'm playing the symbols up here, if I'm hitting the symbol at this angle, the stick's going to push me back into this wrist position and could really hurt me. And if I'm playing very low symbols because I think they look cool and I'm trying to hit the symbols down here, I'm down into wrist flexion and could irritate the wrist. So guys, find a neutral position. Make sure your arm is in a relatively comfortable position. But if you're any of the guys who play metal perhaps and you've got the large double bass setup and the hi-hat's really far away, I would be careful with that because if you're playing your hi-hats like this, there's a lot of strain going through it and could really, really hurt. Now we're going to talk about the ride and all the same rules apply. The difference is this is a much more force absorbing instrument. So we could get away with a little bit more as far as how much wrist flexion that we go into because the cymbal is going to absorb a little bit. But we also need to make sure we've got a lot of range of motion back because we may have to pull the stick back more, more than the bouncy surface of the hi-hat. So the same rule applies. Now, Depending on what part of the instrument you play, do you play the actual body of the cymbal or more play the bell? But same idea, hold your arm firmly at your side, turn your arm out, and you want to hold your stick about two inches above the cymbal. Now again, same thing here. You can see my arm is relatively straight and creates almost a straight line with my stick when my stick is two inches above the cymbal, which means that if I hit the cymbal, and the symbol for whatever reason pushes me back because I'm crashing, I have all of this extra range of motion to go through, which keeps me in a safe position and again protects my wrists. Same as before, if your ride is too high and you're chomping at it this way to get the crashes and your wrist is getting shoved back into radial deviation and you're pinching this point, you're going to have problems. If your symbol's too high, you're going to have problems. And alternatively, if you're playing a jazz setup and your arm is up, up like this because you're trying to play and look really cool, your arm is going to get exhausted because we have that massive moment arm. As my future wife would say, whoopa! Now we have rack toms. Okay, she wouldn't say the rack tom part. Now what's important with the rack toms? Well, wrist-wise, all the same things as the snare drum and the auxiliary floor instruments. We need to make sure that your wrists, depending on the grip you choose, are in a happy position. Now there are two big things we're going to talk about. First is the assessment. So I want you to take your drumsticks, hold them two inches above your snare drum, and you're going to move your arms forward but almost like a pressing motion forward to your first rack tom. Now it may not be right in front of you like mine is, but go two inches above the snare drum and reach right to the middle of that rack tom. Now if you're there, do you feel any strain? Now the answer should be yes, because since my arms are extended out in front of me, there is a greater moment arm and more torque, which means my arms are going to have to work harder. But is there a lot of strain? Because if you're really reaching out or really reaching down or really reaching up, it could be putting a lot more strain through your neck. One thing you could watch for if you have a mirror is when you bring your arms forward, do you see your traps or shoulder blades go up at all? Because the same with the other instruments is if you reach for that instrument and you shrug up a bit or you shrug up a bit, that means that your neck's working. You should be able to very relaxed and easily get to the center of the tom. We're going to do the same thing to the next tom. Now you should be able to do this from your shoulders or your torso without too much strain. 
This is the thing, guys. I've seen people with huge rack tom setups where they got 8 inch, 10 inch, 12 inch, 14 inch, and they have a rack tom way over here. If you have one of those guys, check to see how does it feel on your arms when you're reaching out there to play the center of the instrument. Probably straining. Be careful, guys, because these instruments, I would say, are like primary, secondary instruments. We play them a lot, but not nearly as much as these snare drum, hi-hat, and ride, but you need to make sure your wrists are in a happy position. The last thing is the angle. Now, it's definitely important you have a bit of an angle towards you. If you have a completely flat tom, which is popular, you are in this position when you're reaching forward that your wrist may have to go into flexion to actually hit the drum, which is fine if you have that range of motion, but there's a greater risk to it. There's also a greater risk you're going to hit the rim, which you may want to do on purpose, but just be aware of that. If you have a slight angle, the angle will actually give you, when you hit the drum, this 90 degree angle, remember we talked about that tangent earlier, that when I hit the drum, my drum stick is going to come straight back towards me. If I have a, a tom at this flat angle that you see some people have, when I hit the drum, my wrist is already extended and I don't have anywhere else to go, and that leads to injury. A flat, too low tom where I'm shoving into flexion too far, that can lead to injury. Make sure your angles allow for the bounce of the stick to be natural. And seriously, guys, it's as simple as if you feel any strain, don't go there. All right, modern drummer fans, so in conclusion of article series number five, we added rack toms, we added ride cymbals, we added hi-hats. I got something else set up over here. We didn't talk about that yet. We'll be doing that next month. So next month, we're going to be talking about secondary suspended instruments like stacks, crashes, auxiliary crashes, and all those other instruments. And then we're going to finally have a fully assembled drum set. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please, if you have any questions, reach at me at drummechanics.com or reach out to Modern Drummer. This is Brandon, your biomechanics and fitness resource for the Modern Drummer. Thanks for tuning in. Stay healthy.